Morning, everybody. Uh, kind of underestimated the interest level in this talk, so we do apologise for the lack of uh, seating, but um, thank you all for coming along. I'd like to introduce James Turnbull, who's going to be talking about the cross-platform multi-system configuration management software known as Puppet. James. G'day guys. Um, first and foremost, um, I should have explained a bit about what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'm not going to be talking about Drizzle, that's down the hall. Um, uh, I'm also not Luke Kniez, um, in case anyone, uh, he's much more handsome and has a much more charming southern accent. Um, uh, Luke is the primary developer of Puppet, and uh, in my role in the the, uh, the group is uh, one, another one of the developers, the release manager, and sort of community wrangling, we'll call it. Um, feel free to ask questions. I'm trying to keep as interactive as possible, particularly with so many people, um, and jump in if you've got questions. Um, a bit about what, what I'm, I guess, what I'm talking about. This the, the talk is twofold. It's a bit of an introduction to Puppet, and it's also a bit about configuration management, and. Um, the idea here is that um, I think some people have a sort of an idea that, that, that Puppet's a good thing and that automation is a good thing, but have trouble selling it um, because uh, management don't necessarily see it as, as, as something that they need to have. Um, so my discussions are a bit about um, you know, some of the business benefits, and I'll try and limit the management speak um, of Puppet, as well as a bit of an introduction to what Puppet actually is. Um, I just want to start talking about so where do I come from and I guess why am I interested in Puppet. Um, I came from a mid-range mainframe background many, many long years ago and um, uh, I think the third or fourth box I managed looked very much like this, um, which is an IBM AS100. And I was taught IT skills, I guess, by a bunch of guys in their 50s who um, had come from that sort of big mainframe, big iron shops. And um, they were a really interesting bunch of guys because they, um, you know, uh, they were some of the sort of guys who founded some of the founding principles that you see in things like ITIL now, um, uh, IT pr process and practice. And they came from environments where you expected to know things like, uh, or, you know, our, our, our box looks like this, and these are the 10 things we do today, and we change tapes, and we follow a checklist. It's very structured and organ ordered organizations. And about 20 years ago, the client server world intruded on that space, and all of a sudden, instead of one big mainframe or a big mainframe and a test mainframe, uh, machines started to multiply. And uh, instead of needing uh, one box to run your production application in your insurance company, you now needed a web front end and therefore needed a, you know, 50 web servers and some application servers and whatever three-tiered stack you needed. And that meant that some of the ordered world disappeared, and it became increasingly hard um, because of the n large number of assets that were being deployed to actually manage all of those assets. And instead of knowing you know, exactly where something was on your mainframe, um, you could be spread across 50 boxes um, and, and therefore um, led to, a, I guess, an issue where, where, where um, it became increasingly hard for, for people to actually, actually manage um, assets and for increasingly hard for people to get an understanding of what their environment looked like. Configuration management, um, and uh, this is my, my probably my favourite saying, keep it simple, stupid and short. Um, anyone who's ever been in the military will have seen this, that's one of their favourite principles. They don't do it very often, but they like to say it a lot. Um, so when these big mainframe shops uh, started to diversify and a lot of other organisations, particularly in the web space, you know, um, uh, companies divergent as things like Six Apart and uh, uh, Twitter and people like that, you know, have, have hundreds of virtual servers and so forth. Um, they sort of lost this whole configuration management concept and they lost this understanding of what their assets look like. Um, you know, they, they lost an, an, an ability to, to, um, to manage their environments in a, in a fairly efficient sort of way. Um, so we sort of, I guess Puppet is an attempt in, to some extent to introduce some of those configuration management principles uh, back, into, um, back into an environment. And as I said, I'm going to try and limit the management speak, but all of these things are, are uh, I guess what configuration management is from, from, a, from a model perspective. So it's a management model for infrastructure applications and data. Um, a lot of people do the infrastructure piece, very few people do the applications and data piece. Um, so infrastructure, the, the host you run things on, uh, at least most organizations have something like an enterprise monitoring system that says, I know what box does what, and I know generally speaking what it's supposed to look like. Um, very few people do the same thing with applications, um, and that's just why when people tend to lose things like 
uh, application servers that can be quite hard to recover. Um, developers do things like change things on the fly and other helpful stuff. Uh, and data, um, very few people track sort of uh, what their data is supposed to look like and where it is and data classification and stuff like that. Um, and configuration management essentially is the documentation of attributes and operations. It's really, um, uh, really very simply is, I have a thing and it looks like this and, and it should look like this. Um, if I want to change it, change that thing, then that's what it's going to look like now. So, and the last piece in there is that it, it's the validation, audit and verification function. So as I said, I'm going to try and skip over as much as the management speak. Um, I have some ITIL books here. I'm, I'm not a huge ITIL fan, though my organisation adopts it, uh, adopts it, adopted it quite heavily. Um, I think uh, you know every framework for its place. Um, so configuration management fits very closely into, I guess, what what we'd call change management. So that the, the things we change in our environment. Um, so if I, if I take a good example um, of uh, of, a, of a classic configuration management problem is that. We, we, have a, uh, we have a change, we decide we're going to, to upgrade or patch on all of our web servers. We get part way through the change and we discover that 10 of our web servers, in fact, oh, they're on BSD boxes instead of uh, Linux boxes because we forgot those are legacy ones. And uh, part way through the change, we need to do two choices. We can say we back out of the change because we don't know what happened, or we, on the fly, we decide to make continue with the change and, and do some adjustments. Uh, without a configuration management system, this is going to lead to, will probably lead to disaster. If that's even if your change succeeds in the first place. And the reason for this is that in a configuration configuration managed environment, you are going into the environment going, well, first and foremost, you knew you, knew you had the best day boxes. But secondly, you have, you're able to say, here's what my environment looks like now. Here's what my change is going to be. And at the end of that feedback loop, here's what, here's what my configuration is going to look like. Um, and that's something that sounds really simple and sensible, um, and very few people do it. And I've seen a number of changes I've seen where I, I sit on a technical bridge with 10 technical people who are talking about the way they're going to change the, uh, however you choose to, to run your change, the way they're going to change the implementation script or, or their detailed implementation plan on the fly because something didn't look the way they thought it did. And uh, that way leads hell and disaster. Um, do you need configuration management? Personally, I think everyone does. Um, but there's some prime examples of, of why you do. The uh, first one is everyone has lots of hosts, though they may not necessarily know it always, that look the same, uh, well, have, sorry, have the same function, but never quite look the same. So I work in an environment where lots of different people build boxes. Um, and particularly, it's a kind of job you always give a grad or, or the work experience guy. Um, and as a result, uh, let's say some boxes get built more uniquely than others. <laughs> So here we have our, our friendly cat and uh, and another cat. Do the same. Look, the, so there's the same basic function. One's got fur, the other one doesn't. Um, and that generally tends to be how a lot of hosts end up looking like. So uh, also it tends to be you know you buy different hardware at different times. The company decides one week it's going to be Dell, the next week it's going to be HP. Uh, and you know one week somebody likes Tomcat at this version, and next week somebody decides oh we we'll need that feature, we'll upgrade that, but never goes back and updates the others. So if you have an environment like that, where there's lots of change, um, where there's lots of different assets and lots of different people with their fingers in the pie, uh, you definitely need to think about configuration management. And as I said, high levels of failed change. Um, now, I work in a big environment, a bank. Uh, we have about, I don't know, 12, 13,000 assets that, that are something you'd call a server, not counting things like network devices. And uh, I'm not allowed to tell you how many failed changes we have because it not, doesn't happen and your money's perfectly safe. Um, uh, but there are big shops where less than 10% of their changes can succeed sometimes. And by succeed, I mean actually happen the way you planned it. And that's what an actual change is. Changing a change on the fly is not a, suc a, a successful change. That means you have not done your change management right, and odds are an auditor coming back will go, you know, don't like you, and uh, here's an audit item on why you should fix up change management. And being forced to go to idle seminars is very, very boring and dull. Don't make auditors do that to you. <laughs> And lastly, this is one of my favourite pictures, and in fact, I think it might be, it even might be an environment in Australia. Um, but uh, we all know these days that, that, that speed to market is really important, one of them is on what your organisation is. Um, you've all got customers, whether they are cu people, people who pay you money or not. Um, and as a result, you're expected to deliver infrastructure really, really quickly. Um, ISPs are the place that the, where this is the, the logical conclusion. Um, so, you know, you, you, you decide you want a, a new website or a new virtual server or whatever it is, and your ISP says, we'll guarantee you we'll have one up and running in 
two hours or 12 hours or whatever it happens to be. And a lot of businesses make or break on that promise. So particularly in the web space, in the service software as a service, uh, a good company example of this is a company like Engine Yard, does Rails hosting. Um, you know, they, they stay in business because they guarantee their customers, if you need 20 more mongrels, we'll give you 20 more mongrels and it'll take us an hour. Um, and if you're in that sort of environment, uh, particularly where you're delivering projects on a, on a, you know, not necessarily on a minute to minute basis, but a project like we have a new product, it needs to have a, a new set of infrastructure, you've got two weeks to deliver that. Um, and if you can't, uh, well, that, that, that you're out of a job. So there are, there are lots, of, lots of environments like that where configuration management is a tool that allows you to automate a lot of that process, a lot of provisioning, a lot of build, um, and to be able to say, I just push this button and all of my boxes get built. And literally that's quite a lot of the ISP environments. That it literally is push a button and it says, or even more automated, pick up a, a ticket and, and create a new, new host. Um, the question I get asked a lot, and I threw this slide in, is, um, is, it, is it just for enterprises? So Puppet has a, a really broad customer base. Um, it's very heavily used in universities. Stanford and MIT both use it um, on, on across uh, quite a large platform. Um, it's used in uh, a lot of commodity businesses. Uh, Google is an example of, uh, of they've let us tell, it, tell people they're now a customer. They manage 6,000 OSX desktops with this, which belong to developers and people who don't use Linux in or Google, I presume. Um, so, you know, we have some very big shops, we have some very small shops. The smallest shop I'm aware of is a, a guy who has 10 machines. He has a, a point of sale business, and those 10 machines sit out in uh, video stores in um, Salt Lake City or something like that. And basically, he um, uses this tool to manage all of those boxes because he can't go on site all that often and it's a drive around and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think it, it doesn't matter what size your enterprise is. Um, if you have mission critical services and you need to deliver stuff on time, um, a tool like a configuration management tool is the right way to go. Really quickly, um, the benefits, um, and these are, uh, are, are hopefully, this is the last of the management speak, I think, um, is reproducibility. Um, essentially, you can make your hosts look like the way they should um, and repeat that. Um, accuracy, um, you know, your hosts are, ho host, host are, host are actually all of the same version, all of the same configuration files, all of your, your boxes resolve the right DNS, whatever you happen to want to configure. Uh, again, um, uh, look at decision support um, is a big thing, and, and, and a lot of people don't realise that the configuration management. So, decision support is the information you need in order to persuade persuade your employer, your, your boss, um, your your customers that they need to spend money on things like infrastructure and services. If you can tell them that, um, uh, or or to make particular decisions like risk-based decisions. So, a good example here um, that I've heard recently. If you're able to, uh, let's say there's a vulnerability that's been released for Apache, and you, you say to yourself, well, I think we've got about 50 web servers. I wonder what version they are. Okay, well, I'll go out to the boxes and I'll, I'll, I'll do Capistrano, or I'll, I'll do a, a bash script or a shell, um, an SSH shell, and I'll log onto all those boxes and I'll suck down, I'll do an RPM if you're a Fedora shop, you know, dash Q, and I'll return Apache version, I'll compile that in an Excel spreadsheet, and then I'll work out how many hours it's going to take me to upgrade that box, and on and on and on it goes. Got a configuration management system. You go to configuration management system and said, "Please tell me wh what the version of all my Apache boxes are and provide a report." Um, and you are then able to go, "Well, that's a significant part of the hard work." And if you're also able to quickly demonstrate that something like, "Oh, well, we have 500 Apache boxes and uh, and you'd like to roll well, out uh, a Tomcat on all of those." Well, I hate to break it to you, we can't do it by Tuesday because we do have 500 of them. And here's why. Um, and that, a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, uh, is you know is really important and really probably not recognised as much environments should. And the last one is something that everybody loves. It saves money. Um, and if you can demonstrate that it takes you a lot less time to do something in an automated way that you would otherwise ha have to do manually, um, it's really clear that that you can do fun stuff. Uh, you can save the organisation money and look good at the same time. Um, and all of this leads for you personally, uh, it will relevant to all the management speak, uh, to my favourite slide. Uh, as Luke Kniez refers to it, you get to the pub a lot faster. Um, and and it, it, I'm a firm believer in that. I think, um, I think we all understand that in IT we work very long hours um, and we often do it for very stupid reasons. Uh, and if we can find tools that make our life easier, get us out of the door faster. Um, and if management you know, uh, also gets to a pat in the head from, the, from their customers to say, wow, isn't IT efficient? That's no, all good for, as far as I'm concerned. And usually means more money for beer. Um, just really quickly, um, 
risks and challenges around configuration management. Um, the first thing I always say to people is a tool is not a process. And this is a mistake a lot of people make in IT. Uh, particularly if you've gone out and bought an really expensive tool, let's say um, hypothetically an ERP system that might have three letters in it and it could potentially be SAP. Um, <laughs> so people buy SAP a lot of, a lot of time because they, they, they say SAP does all of these amazing wonderful things and, and this is amazing German software, efficient German software company. Uh, almost no one realizes that when you buy SAP out of the box it does not do anything you think it does. You have to, you have to significantly modify SAP to make it customized for an environment um, to match your processes. And the key part here is that a tool isn't a process. You can have the world's best tool, and, and seriously, I think Puppet's the world's best configuration management tool. But if you install Puppet and don't do any process work, you're not going to get anywhere. Um, and you need to build that process around it. You need to integrate it into your change management, into your help desk systems, um, and into your environment. Um, information is power, and accurate information is all powerful. I, wouldn't, I would suggest that if you are feeling a bit nervous about your environment and not sure what's going on, it's a good, good thing to go and look at, at what's out there before you embark on a configuration management project. Um, start small. Start look at, look at something simple you can, can automate. Uh, a lot of people, the classic example used in a lot of documentation is sudo. The extent of a sudo is file for those of you in the, um, who, who Play sudo um, is something that, that is designed to be distributed across lots of hosts. Very few people do it. They, all, they edit each single individual host and then uh, completely unnecessarily. So we tell people, well, how about the first thing you do is install, you set a puppet to install and configure sudo and sp distribute a, an etc. sudo as file that everybody can use. And you can build on stuff like that um, quite easily. Um, Best practice uh, is, I guess, an extension of that, and that is um, embed your configuration management to your lifecycle. If you buy boxes, um, if you build boxes, stick your configuration management in there. So you have a little gate in all of your, your change requests or your, your help desk tickets that says, uh, I have put a box and, uh, and I must update the, chain, the configuration management system, whether it be a database or your spreadsheet or what it happens to be, uh, or inside the tool itself. Um, and when I decommission a box, I must take that data out. Um, and that way you don't have the problem of getting to the end of the year and going, what did happen to those 10 boxes or do we have still have these? Uh, it's a fairly common complaint. Um, categorize, modularize and standardize. Um, everybody says to me, but my environment's different. Nothing's the same. All my mailbox servers are different because they serve some different purpose. Well, they're all mail servers, aren't they? Generally speaking, they're probably all a Postfix or a Send mail box or an Exxon box. Well, there you go. They've got the same package on them. Um, maybe not necessarily the same version, but at least the, the, you can find criteria of information that, that have commonalities. And you'd be quite surprised when you start to tear some of your environments to pieces how many of those commonalities there are and how many of those commonalities by automation can actually be made a lot easier to manage. Um, Control, um, I guess, is, um, is, is a big thing, and that is, that is stuff like to be able to go. And uh, I think somebody used the example in the sysadmin miniconf of, uh, uh, I think Dev just used an example of the sysadmin miniconf on Monday of uh, a junior developer uh, managing to lock everybody out of, a, out of, out of their boxes, out of their box uh, as a result of, um, uh, of uh, denying the denying host or something like that. Um, the, um, the response for, for a lot of people is, um, oh, you know, crap, do I go and have to visit all my boxes now? I can't sign on to them. Do I have to go to the data center? Continuation management tools generally do things, uh, generally belong to an automated life cycle. So th the next time your, your configuration management system wakes up, it'll go, hmm, that doesn't look like that. It shouldn't look like that. I'll reset it back the same way it was, um, and you then be able to log in again. This is another common way people use for firewall changes. Um, configuration management tool, a lot of us are probably familiar with the Sleep 5, you know, uh, restart IP tables when we've discovered that we've blocked SSH. Uh, at 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, configuration management tool may not necessarily be um, uh, the may not necessarily be the perfect solution, but certainly w you, you can trigger a configuration run and reset your firewall back to the same way it was. Um, it's a way of uh, avoiding having to go into the data center. And the other piece around best practice is, is test, test, and test again. So uh, an example of somebody locking out everybody out of, out of their hosts. Um, uh, I firmly recommend that you don't roll out configuration you haven't tested first. Um, so, you know, have a box, build a box, um, have a bunch of boxes, build them uh, in an environment, uh, and that way um, you are not um, pushing out. I mean, it's the same as if you use a configuration manager to put system to push out uh, untested changes, it's as bad as not having one in the first place, um, and it's uh, certainly not going to make you very popular when you break things. Um, quickly, who sells this? Uh, evil proprietary software vendors, lots of them. Uh, every, every man and his dog in, in the enterprise systems market has a product that is allegedly a configuration management tool. 
um, or a CMDB or Configuration Management Database. Um, what's wrong with most of them? Um, two key problems. Yeah, two key problems are archaic and monolithic. So all of these companies, people like BMC and IBM and Tivoli, uh, CAE, uh, Unicenter, um, and I've just probably damned half my company's vendors. Um, uh, I, I did miss a call, that's quite correct. <laughs> I noticed you in the audience over and I don't want to get stabbed. Um, they sell a, a bunch of products. They sell tools that let you monitor your environment. They let, sell tools that help you with performance management. They sell tools that help you with asset management and ticketing systems. Yeah, quite correct. So they often, they often don't keep up with changes, so they're often quite archaic. So you, you, I mean, we all come from environments where we have, uh, maybe have some Ubuntu, maybe have some Fedora, maybe have some BSD, maybe have some Windows Box to help us all. Um, we have environments where we have Solaris and UAX and, and HPUX. A lot of these companies simply do not keep up with this stuff and, and they do not, are not able to manage large scale, large scale systems. They also tend to be very monolithic, so it's lowest common denominator. So they say, we have a configuration management tool. But now actually, we came from an enterprise monitoring background. So enterprise monitoring tool, that's really cool. Uh, BMC Patrol, you know, it's the best tool for monitoring your performance. Um, in terms of uh, uh, doing configuration management, we needed to have something, because the marketing department told us that's the buzzword this week, and that's going to sell more product. But it doesn't do very much. Um, and that's quite a common response. Who gives it away? Well, that would be us. Yeah, you know, if I open source, look at the happy child. I compared to the factory. Let's have a quick look back here. What's going on? No, quack. There we go. Evil factory. Happy child. Yay. <laughs> I don't know where I found that picture, but I really think it's funny. Um, so, introducing Puppet. Um, the two partners in Puppet are, uh, I guess, uh, the primary developers, uh, Luke Kinnies and uh, Andrew Schaefer. Um, Andrew doesn't look that scary all of the time. Um, yes, most of the time, anyway. But um, would you buy software from these guys? Thankfully, they don't have to. They give it away. So what is Puppet? The key piece of Puppet is Puppet abstracts configuration as resources. So instead of saying, uh, instead of saying um, uh, a piece of configuration is app get install something, it says install a uh, package something install. And we'll come to that in a tick. It allows relationships. So it allows you to say, my packages are linked to services. Uh, if I install a service, I sh if I install a package, I do so should do something like restart a service. Or if I change a configuration file, I should restart the service. Or, or if I install a package and it doesn't install this user, I should install these 10 users. All of that sort of stuff. Um, it's important. So essentially what happens is that it's designed to be so that what you, if you, ch if you, um, what's the best way of describing this is, um, if you have something occur, it should happen the same way over and over again. So the configuration, configuration system is designed to say, I will, I will check that my configuration looks like this, I'll run this again, and my configuration will be pushed back the way it should, and over and over again. Correct, yes. Um, so how is things managed? Uh, it, it's a, uh, Puppet has an external, uh, external language, as I said, that, things that defines things like packages and files and services. It's a declarative language, so in the sense it says, uh, what am I defining as opposed to how am I defining it? So we care about the what you want to do, not the how you want to do it. The underlying guts of Puppet does the how stuff for you, like this. So there's package Ruby install latest. I should have chosen a package other than Ruby. Everyone gets upset because it, it's written in Ruby. But um, I should have put Perl there for, some, for many people or, or possibly something vendor neutral. Um, uh, <laughs> yes. Yes, thank you. Um, so here we have uh, a bit of the puppet language. And essentially, we've got a, a resource. It's a package. We're saying, what package do you want to install? And we've got an attribute down here which says, ensure it's the latest version of Ruby. And you can set things like you know, a particular version, the latest version, um, whatever you like. You can also uninstall packages and so forth. This might be instantiated on a bunch of different systems. And these are the ones I could just come off the top of my head. Um, puppet underneath it will run all of these commands if it identifies that your system requires a, a particular, so on Gen 2 it'll say, oh no, I'm a Gen 2 box, I will emerge Ruby, and God help you while you wait for that to happen. Uh, or even worse, you might have a gem, or you might have UpToDate, or Fink, or uh, a number of other supported platforms. And here's a, a slightly larger example of a whole service we're working, and this is a fairly simple version. There's lots of people have done some very cool and complicated things with Bind. Essentially, rather than yum install Rind on a Fedora box, uh, update our configuration and start the service, we do all the same things with, with, with Puppet. 
We install, we install a package, um, we download a, a, a configuration file for it, and, we, and then we start the service. You, and you can do things, as I said, like build relationships by saying, if the new if configuration file is new, restart service. Um, or if package is installed, you know, restart service, and so on. Um, some of the technical detail, um, it's a client server model. There's a puppet master. The puppet master knows about your configurations and your hosts. Um, it communicates um, via uh, encrypted SSL and uses certificates to authenticate things. So you tell, uh, you cite your puppet master up, and the puppet master says, "I'm here. I'm waiting for a connection." One of your clients comes along and says, "I'm host number one, and uh, uh, I, I want to connect to you." You, the master says, "Yep, I like you. We'll sign your certificate, and off we go." Um, and then they, are, they communicate back and forth to say, um, "Host number one says, oh, I want my configuration, Puppet says, I know who you are, and you're on a web Apache web server, and I'm going to push down all your Apache configuration for you. And then every half hour after that, the, s the client wakes up and says, and you can change that, that's uh, uh, the default. Every half hour, the client wakes up and says, Is my, here's my configuration again, am I still supposed to look like this? Uh, or it says, my configuration has changed, what should I do about it? Should I change back to what the default is, or should I notify you, and, and so forth. It's very Unix-centric currently. Um, we have... Um, a little bit of stuff in the Windows space, I'll talk about that in a, in, in a moment, but uh, essentially we are we are very heavily into the, into the Unix world. It's fairly extensible. Um, you don't have to know, learn very much in the way of Ruby to actually extend Puppet. Um, we find that most people can do everything they want to do out of the box. There's lots of different resources, and I'll come to that in a moment, but if you do want to do something, um, it is fairly easy to extend, and yes, it is written in Ruby. I, I point that out for all of the Python people who hate me. Um, so this is some new stuff for those of you who are already familiar with Puppet. Um, we're just uh, about to introduce support for Xenos, for those of you who use it, uh, to allow you to automatically create um, Xenos hosts to be monitored. So you build a new box, and Puppet says, ah, this box needs to be part of Xenos. And you say, add this box to Xenos, add this, this monitoring checks, and set Xenos off to go and monitor it. So you don't even need to come back to the box later after you've built it. So add it to your enterprise monitoring system, Puppet will do it for you already, and will do the same thing with Nagios currently too. Um, I never may able to pronounce this right, and somebody from Red Hat may be able to say it better than I, but Orgias, which as Jeff Wall pointed out to me, sounds very, very wrong. Um, OGS is, a, is, a, is a, a tool that Red Hat's written, which is um, designed, it knows what, basically it knows what configuration files look like, and it creates little things called lenses, and it allows you to do things like, um, uh, it knows what a, the, the named.com configuration file looks like, and allows you to template and build um, configurations quite quickly. We've also just uh, enhanced the conditionals. Previously, our conditionals were very simple if-else statements, with sort of Boolean um, if-else statements. Now they are much more sophisticated. Allow you to do things like, if uh, IP address is blah, then do something else. Else, do something else, um, and a variety of other things. We've also introduced a tool that does automated documentation of modules. So um, essentially, it allows you to, to write your Puppet configuration and add comments in it. And then at the end of the process, you can tell Puppet to spit that out in Wiki or an RDoc or something like that. So you can actually document, create an instant sort of uh, ops manual or configuration uh, Print out for each of your hosts uh, without just by adding comments in, into your into your manifest. So you kill two birds with one stone, and I, I don't know anyone who, who loves documentation. I, I like it, but I don't love it. Um, and anything that makes document documentation that doesn't involve uh, me writing it is good. Um, we also need support for SE Linux for those people who are who are enthusiastic about SE Linux, not me. Um, and we've also got a, a Windows port on the way, um, and that's sort of I guess six months off, but it, it's it's on the way. Um, so what else can be managed? Uh, we have 30 package types, so um, uh, by saying package something, we, we can instantiate that package or install it on 30 different types of operating systems. Uh, we can uh, do the same thing on, on of users and groups on pretty much uh, pretty much anything you can poke a stick at. Uh, we've got guys running on HPOX and uh, AIX. Same thing with services, um, all the way across uh, OSX and uh, uh, all the BSDs, um, you can even puzzle out some of the more complicated ways of starting and stopping things on uh, on Solaris, if you so wish. Um, said Nagios, we do a lot, a lot of work in the Nagios space. We can automate all of your, your systems adding themselves to Nagios. And as I said, we've got support for the most platforms there. Um, I don't like the word in the cloud, but the, oh, the cloud computing, but it is, it is out there. Puppet integrates always part of a number of these tools. Um, those are fairly heavily, heavily um, 
uh, Red Hat influence there because Red Hat's a very heavily adopted Puppet. The fact the Fedora project actually uses Puppet to manage all their infrastructure. Um, and there's a lot of companies out there that, that do things like uh, management for Amazon, um, uh, for E2, and uh, there's lots of people who do provisioning, Kickstart and Precede and things like that with Puppet. And there's lots of helpful recipes and stuff like that on the Puppet Wiki to allow you to do things like provisioning. And uh, somebody's almost certainly done it before you and uh, will probably be able to make uh, a provisioning system for you. Um, some Puppet sort of concepts, I guess. Uh, Puppet, um, as I said, the various bases are, is what's called resources, and they're things like packages and services. You can bundle those resources together in what we call classes and definitions. Now, a class is a collection of resources, so the service we looked at earlier, Bind, uh, or in this case, uh, the Postfix class, would just be a class that says, I am the collection of, of these particular resources. And then you can they say, this particular host needs to have this particular class. So you might have a class that is um, all your common configuration, all of your admin users and your sudo is configuration, uh, your aliases file, all of those sort of common stuff you use. You might have a class called common, every host gets that. Your mail servers might get the postfix class and maybe the PF log sum class. Um, your DNS servers might get the bind class and your database servers might get the, get the, S, uh, the MySQL thing. It's essentially a way of allowing you to bundle up a bit of configuration. Definitions are a similar sort of thing, uh, but they're more of a repeatable application. So it's a little way of saying all of these. So for example, you can put a, uh, a definition together that um, that says um, all configuration files for Postfix need to have be owned by this user and, and have this permission and go through the system and, 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 uh, and call this little definition every time you need to update that. So I guess a little bit of a, a macro shorthand. We also have a thing called modules and um, modules are collections of these classes, definitions and resources and the reason they're interesting and useful is twofold. The uh, first one is um, they're very portable, so you can just pick up a, a module and drop it onto, a, uh, onto an environment and include it so that and you can say, uh, Puppet will automatically recognize your value module and say, do you want to install this on a, uh, configure this on a particular host? The second reason it's interesting is because it allows people to, um, to distribute modules. So there's a, there's a large collection of Puppet modules, so if you have something that you manage, almost certainly someone has, has, has created a module for that already. Um, I counted at uh, last count, um, I think there are 120 or 30 modules in one of the module repositories and there are four or five of people who have done you know, different approaches to modules. So you can essentially, out of the box, install Puppet, look for a bunch of modules to say manage the various things you own uh, and add them, uh, add those modules in and you, you don't have to actually even write any Puppet manifests other than to set customize them a little bit for your environment potentially um, in order to get started. Uh, all of your clients, uh, we call them nodes, and essentially we, uh, a node is, um, uh, we identify it by its host name, and we say node web server at domain.com, include the web server, and that could be a module or a class, and when that node connects, when that web server connects, um, pop the puppet master says, you need to have this configuration, and pushes down whatever's inside that module. Um, we also list a bunch of collections of nodes, so um, you can say all of these nodes need to be the database, ha need to have the database module. And you can inherit uh, nodes, so you can have a, a common node um, that is, uh, or, or you know, um, e every node should look like this, and then add, uh, add, add um, additional nodes, on, uh, add additional sort of bits of configuration on top. As I said, um, relationships are very important to Puppet because they're very important to configuration. Um, so we have a, a, a fairly um, I, th I think it's a reasonably comprehensive collection of ways you can relate to things. Uh, I won't go through each of them; they're all fairly obvious. Um, uh, yeah, but generally speaking, do things like, you know, don't try and start the bind service unless the bind package is installed. Um, sensible things like that, which, um, which you know, uh, obviously you're, if you're doing this in a manual way, you, you know instinctively, but Puppet doesn't know that, uh, and we have to tell it. Um, and uh, particularly useful is things, as I said, that are responsive. So if something changes, um, restart yourself or, or so on. Uh, very quickly, the Puppet language is, um, is, is very simple. Um, you can create simple things like arrays, uh, you have variables, so you have conditionals, case statements, like does anyone who's done any, any scripting um, is going to recognize, um, the, I guess, the basic language elements. Um, some people describe it as a little bit Ruby-esque. Uh, I don't personally, I don't, I don't think it is, I think it's, a, it's, it's Puppet's own language. Um, we also have a Ruby DSL that's not very well used or developed, but it is available, and that's if you want to write your configuration stuff in Ruby itself. Um, uh, some people do, a lot of Ruby developers are very keen on that as a concept. Uh, we have another useful feature called templates, and templates are essentially 
allow you to say, here's a configuration file, and instead of putting in a particular value, let's say uh, resolve, resolve.conf. So we know we want to know what domain we're, talking, we're looking at, and we want to know what resolvers we want to look up. So we create a little template file that says, here's the structure of the configuration file, and here's some variables in place of the actual domain and the actual resolvers we want to talk to. Uh, and you're able to, um, to then, then say, if the client connects, it says, I'm this client, um, I would like this configuration file, and you drop in the appropriate values depending on what. So you can actually say, uh, my clients are all my DMZ clients, and they have a different domain and a different set of resolvers, so drop in that value there instead. Of, and that allows you to pretty much um, configure um, uh, most configuration files. So if there's an actual type, like a, like a you can't, uh, for example, um, uh, you can manage file mounts with Puppet, um, if there was, if, but you can't manage, for example, um, that's a good example, uh, or say namedd.conf, you can't, there's not a type that configures bind for you, um, so you can actually just create a template of the bind configuration file. What's the ERB? So ERB is, is, um, is a templating language for Ruby, um, and it's very simple to use. Um, and um, it's uh, we've got a fair bit of documentation about how you use Puppet, how, how Puppet uses ERB um, on the wiki. Um, and I, I, I found most people manage to get into to ERB pretty simply. And if you've done M4, ERB is like yeah, any any child's play, kindergarten kid stuff. Um, the way Puppet does a fair bit of its work is with another tool called Factor, which we also develop. And Factor is essentially a little tool that you run on your clients, and when asked, it returns all the information about your clients. Um, so it, when it runs, it tells you what, what the client's IP address is. Um, those values are all available to the master. So when you, your client connects and says, please tell me what my IP address should be um, for this particular interface, or please tell me what, um, what uh, particular version of something I should have, um, Puppet is able to drop in those values for each individual thing. So you get th important things like um, a lot of configuration files use host name, for example. So P Factor delivers the m to the Puppet Master a, a, a variable um, saying host name equals something, um, and you're allowed to you can drop that into your configuration. So you can say if the host name is something, you should you should do this, or if if the IP address is something, and, and so forth. You can group and class um, things together. So particularly important is things like kernel and operating systems. You can say all of my Ubuntu boxes must look like this. Um, so a little bit, um, I guess the last last piece is is um, the thing, once you can actually determine whether you've succeeded with configuration management, and this is uh, more than Puppet, more broadly, is uh, if you get increased in variability, uh, reduction in incidents, these are all good things to tell management, rate of fail change, build time and speed to market, uh, compliance to SOE and policy and standards. I haven't really talked about that very much, but if you work in this sort of environment, though, which is a large enterprise filled with people who want to make sure everything um, is running efficiently and effectively and uh, to uh, no one's breaching any policy or standards. Um, that's a really big thing uh, that you get with configuration management is that you're able to actually come back and say uh, to an auditor, here's my report that shows that all my hosts have the right versions installed. Um, they all look like this and there's no question that, that, that um, uh, I'm in compliance to our SOE or to our policy and standards. Correct, yes. You don't need to back up the configuration. That's another one. Yeah, sure. Um, and lastly, um, it doesn't mean headcount cuts, it doesn't mean budget cuts. Uh, uh, I think in the current environment we're all nervous about things that might make us redundant. Um, and uh, I think that you'll find that automation means that you actually get to do the things you want to do instead of the really boring rote work. Um, and, uh, and as I said, a better use of time means happier people. Um, Luke likes me to say drunker people, but um, I, we, we could have a, ch we'll a child-friendly audience and say happier people. <laughs> Um, and very quickly, um, Jeff War stole my quote yesterday, and I was very annoyed with him. Um, the future has already arrived, not just evenly distributed, and this is where Puppet is going next. Um, so some of you may know what REST APIs are. Currently we use XML RPC. Um, for those who are interested, I'm happy to talk about that uh, in a non uh, I in a in a non-friendly way. Um, I'm not a big fan of XML RPC. It's a very silly protocol. Uh, REST APIs are essentially a, a way you can actually d create URLs to do certain things instead of um, uh, uh, you know, complex sort of uh, XML, XML passing things back and forth. And we're hoping that's going to deliver better performance and better memory use. Um, for a lot of people, um, Ruby is a challenge because um, I, I love Ruby a lot, but uh, there are moments where Ruby is somewhat less than help performance help you, hel helpful. Um, it's got a lot better, and 1.9 and 2 are going to be uh, significantly different, but um, you know, we're trying to be as efficient as possible, given that there are some limitations with the program language. 
We also look at creating an automated plugin and module system, these things we like, so you can build a Puppet Master very quickly, you can tell it what things you need, or, or have it automatically suck it all down. So you could tell it, I manage these types and these packages, um, and please install the right bits of code. So you only need, you know, the Puppet Master only loads the stuff you need, um, and only loads the configurations you want. Um, that's sort of partially in process at the moment, I suspect that will probably be the end of the year. The REST APIs is, um, the first release candidate of that version is at the end of this month, which will be uh, release 025 if you're, if you're going to look. We're also looking at a lot of integration stuff. Uh, as I said before, a lot of RSPs have automated ticketing systems, for example. You raise a ticket that is provisioning a new box. Um, the ticketing system, uh, no human looks at that beyond to say, yes, we should actually build this box. Um, and then you can have your ticketing system go and talk to Puppet and say, go and build a web server for me, or go and build a, a particular box in the STMZ, or take one of these virtual servers and turn it on and give it to this person, configure it this way. Um, we're also looking at things like uh, output from Puppet, make it a bit more automated in terms of integrated into things like service level management and compliance systems and inventory systems. Um, for a lot of people, um, asset management is not a priority for the organizations, and they very have very little idea what, um, what sort of boxes are floating out there. Uh, a lot of people use configuration management tools to feed into asset management databases, and we're going to look at some automated ways to do that. Um, the last few slides are, these are some, some tools people have built around Puppet. Um, Puppet is, uh, um, the, I guess, they're, uh, the GUI interfaces, for those of you who like GUI interfaces. Um, and a Puppet Show is a tool that allows you to, uh, a GUI that shows you how things are, how things look on your, your hosts. Um, you know, you can query things and uh, determine what, what's in store where and, and uh, you know, all of that sort of stuff, which is all pretty good management stuff. iClassify is another similar tool. Um, it essentially allows you to have a, uh, an, uh, an external database and Puppet supports um, you storing your, your data about your, your clients in uh, LDAP and MySQL and whatever else you want, want to stick it in. We can pull it out of there and, and, and configure your assets. iClassify is a, a pretty fun end for that sort of thing. Um, and um, it uh, does that using uh, an LDAP backend. So a lot of people have LDAP backends already. It's very easy to leverage your existing data um, to configure your hosts. And Puppet View is a, uh, sorry, Puppet View is a, a log management system, um, and it essentially it essentially allows you to, to query what's happening on each and each each time the performance is run. And it says you know nine schedule changes and total twelve changes. It says there's one thing was out of sync and uh, and you know one and a hence wrong thing was applied and that sort of stuff. It's a useful sort of uh, collection of tools. Um, I think I've got about f two or three minutes left. Any time we're running a bit late, so questions? Yeah, there's a the puppet client is a little daemon that runs, and um, you can run it in a couple of different ways. You can leave it as running as a daemon. You can schedule it with cron, or you can tell the master can tell its clients to wake up um, and um, and and connect to it and retrieve the configuration. Oh, sorry. Um, we were asking how the client ca uh, talks to the master. Uh, so there's a question down here. In uh, the DMZ environment, where you don't want the boxes to reach the back, how, how is that managed practically in the real world from a security perspective? So um, I, I, I wear a security hat in my current job, um, and where, where we um, we may or may not use Puppet. Um, the um, it's, this is a when you're trying to manage boxes in a DMZ, you don't want to push all the way back to the zone to to a, to, a, uh, uh, to an internal network. Um, we tend to deploy Puppet Masters dedicated for perimeter security zones, particular security zones, because a Puppet Master is really just the, the daemon and a collection of configuration. We maintain central repositories of configuration, which we push out to those those s sort of sub masters, so they only know about the stuff they have to know about. So if somebody's already compromised your box, they already know about the stuff on the box, but they don't know anything more about anything else, and they pro it provides no mechanism to push back internally. And you can run masters. Masters is not a hugely intensive process, usually. Um, can be depending on a large number of clients, but if, you, if, you, uh, if you're with reasonably effective hardware, you can, you can, you know, it's not an expensive thing to deploy those sort of environments. Does that answer the question? You can do that that way, yes. No, because Puppet, all Puppet cares about is, is your configuration files. So as I said, um, I didn't mention earlier, but most people version control their configuration files, stick it in Subversion or Git. Um, and uh, a good example there is you have a Subversion branch for your DMZ environment, and that branch gets pushed out to your, your submaster, and the master wakes up and says, oh, I know about this configuration. doesn't have to know anything about your rest of your environment, because the, the, the configuration is, is only specific to that. 
It's stored, um, there's a couple, well, the, the most basic ways, it's stored in text files, and so you can edit those with Vim or, or whatever, you, whatever your particular editor, editor of choice is. Um, and as I said, you can also support storing it in LDAP, MySQL, Postgres, a bunch of others. Grant. Um, the question is whether we comply, do have any compliance activities. Um, no, we don't. Um, we, 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 we issue the, the categoric warning to anyone that if you apply a configuration just like downloading any other script or configuration tool without understanding what it does, you're an idiot, idiot and you shouldn't be in IT. I, I, people say I'm very blunt, but seriously, if you download a script and go, this script is supposed to do blah, and then it sends off your, your, some of your mission critical data because you didn't read what the script does, you are really, really stupid and you will lose your job. Um, so we have a system where we're trying to pull all of those modules into a, into a, a common standard um, and that's a slow process. Not everybody likes standards and we're still arguing about what standards should look like but hopefully we'll have a, a bunch of modules that will be standard modules that, that, the, that Reductive says uh, or, or the community says we certify that this module does this and, and we guarantee you some integrity and we'll hash files or how, however we choose to do that. Um, there was a question about Windows before, was it? So Factor already runs on Windows. So um, uh, a guy named, a very clever English guy named Paul Nazareth, um updated Factor to run on Windows. So you can now run, if you've got Ruby on Windows, you can run Factor and spit out all the facts. He's currently working, he and a couple other guys currently working on Windows port. Th I get a lot of cursing about how things do on, on Windows don't do the, the, the things that they do on, on Unix slash Linux from them. So I suspect it's not going all that smoothly. Um, but I'm hoping we'll have something this year. Yep, there's several examples in the Puppet Wiki of Kickstart and Precede sort of things. Um, and there's a variety of people who do similar things with Solaris. And so uh, essentially speaking, Puppet is a, uh, you know, if you, if you any sort of configure, any sort of automated provisioning tool that allows you to call out to another program, and most of them do, you can do things like, oh, go and install my Puppet stuff, start Puppet up, and it will automatically configure your host. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of ways of doing that. Um, so as I said, the factor tool you can you can uh, you can basically query lots of things about about the host. You can create custom facts as well. You can create particular facts that it look about look about other things. The other the other way to do it is um, uh, at the moment it is a, it is a, a process by which you know you need to create the report and then cull some details out of it. But um, Let's take a good example. Um, somebody just talked about this morning was they want to know all of their DMZ hosts that have a particular management IP address, so that they've created a custom fact for that. Um, they've stuck a, stuck a um, uh, uh, stuck that fact into their configuration. There's a, there's a, a, an add-on, I guess, or not an add-on. Um, there's a part of Puppet called Stored Configurations, and essentially that allows you to create a database of, of what your hosts look like. So it says, please retrieve this piece of information stored in the database. You then query the database and create a report from that. Um, you can also do things like um, I gather together the, the so um, if you look at um, uh, you, have, you have a bunch of bunch of configuration items uh, on hosts and you can say I would like to collect all of the SSH keys from all of my hosts and, and upload them to the master so and then distribute them to all of the servers so you can actually say instead of having to distribute a file with all of the SSH keys you can just suck them all up stick them in the authorized keys file and send that around that's just an example of that sort of stuff but you can all sorts of things there one more question. Yes, it does. Sorry, um, the client the client pulls over a single TCP port. Yes, um, uh, eight one three nine. Uh, and well, okay. I can come back to that. Uh, there is a puppet buff. It's on Thursday afternoon at four o'clock, and they've just kind of organised that. Um, I'm not sure which room are we in. Can't remember, but it's on the buff notice board. Um, happy to answer some more questions then. Uh, thanks very much for your time.